never, I never get bored of having my own uh, entry video. Um, one of the best things about coming to a, to a conference like this, besides having my own entry video, is that I get to be surrounded by experts. I mean, Lorenzo's a professor, for Christ's sake. And, and, and Robert before him. These are, these are really smart people. So I get to come to an event like that, soak up all of that information, right? The worst thing about coming to an event like this is my imposter syndrome kicks in real badly because I... These are experts. Lorenzo's a professor, for Christ's sake. I'm just a guy who's made his career out of being incredibly curious about the world around him. Uh, I just ask an awful lot of questions, and I want to know what's going on, and I want to know why things are happening. I'm a strategist by trade, and it, and it pays to, to ask a lot of questions and know a lot of stuff, right? So the thing that is, is filling my brain at the moment is the next big thing. A few years ago... 3D printers, right? 3D printers were going to be everywhere. Every home in the world have a 3D printer. You couldn't attend a conference like Web without someone being here on a stage saying 3D printers are going to revolutionize manufacturing. Manufacturing as an industry is just going to not be the same ever, ever again. I mean, yeah, we're 3D printing heart valves, and, and we can 3D print chocolate, and we can 3D print... Uh, pieces for your Porsche and, it, and its turbo system. But actually, has it revolutionized um, manufacturing? Not, not quite. It hasn't quite lived up to the hype it was promised. The same with voice search, right? 2016, that famous saying that by 2020, half of all internet searches were going to be done by voice. The hype machine went crazy for this stuff. And so voice was all you ever heard. Every stage in the land had someone talking about hype talking about voice search. So the next big thing, then, that we keep hearing an awful lot about is the metaverse, right? This has been hyped beyond all, all reasonable thought processes. The metaverse, this is going to be the crazy next big thing. Even the Wall Street Journal, right? Lorenzo pointed to it. The Wall Street Journal is saying that metaverse spend is going to hit $5 trillion dollars in less than eight years. This, this came out this year. Wall Street Journal, that's quite a trusted document, right? We should be believing this. Yet, what exactly is, to close my last question, what is the metaverse? No one really seems to be able to put, put a handle on what this thing is, right? So we've got Tim Cook. Tim Cook, a couple of weeks ago, came out and said, mm, I don't really know. I can't quite describe to you what the metaverse is. In fact, he actually said, I don't think anyone knows what the metaverse is. This is Matthew Ball, right? Matthew Ball is a well-known investor, and he is Mr. Metaverse, uh, called the Metaverse Revolutionize Everything. There's that phrase again. I was going to revolutionize everything. This is his, uh, his definition. I'm not going to read it out. There's a lot of big words in there. Basically, it is Ready Player One. Ready Player One, where we've got this, this massive virtual 3D world where you drop in and out of and you go and meet your friends and your friends can be from anywhere in the world and you can search around and find information and you can play games, you can live your life however you want to look. You can do it all in this 3D virtual world, this fully immersive, always-on virtual world. Okay, I mean... That was a story, right? That was fiction. That was just some guy made that up. In fact, the guy who actually made it up, well, not Ready Player One, but Neil Stevenson, in 1992, in his book Snow Crash, that's where he first used the term metaverse. That's when it first came out. And what he was talking about was the kind of the internet as this single universal platform in a 3D immersive virtual world. This was where we go to escape reality. We go to, into this place to escape reality, uh, and we're going to live there, and we're going to buy stuff, and we're going to play games, and we're going to visit places. We're going to do everything we could do in normal, everyday life, but we're going to do it on a computer instead, for whatever reason. Not read the book, just learnt off the internet. The metaverse, right, though, it's, it's a collection of lots of things. It's, uh, it's Bitcoin technology, it's NFTs, it's... It's virtual reality, it's augmented reality, it's artificial intelligence, it's a whole host 
of different things, all collected together under this one massive, massive title of the metaverse, right? It reminds me a little bit of back in the early to mid-90s when we used to talk about the information superhighway. That when we didn't quite understand what we were talking about, if we were talking about connected TVs or, or networked computers or we were talking about fiber optic technologies, you know, we, we put it all under this umbrella title of the information superhighway. And then people used to ask, how do, how do I get onto the information superhighway? Where do I find the information superhighway? Can I buy the information superhighway? Uh, it was a nonsense term because it referred to so many things that it didn't really amount to anything at all. Much like the metaverse is not a thing. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing at all. It is a collection of tools that already exist. It's not new. It's, not, it's just a new name for a bunch of stuff that already exists, that you can already engage with. So I'm wondering why this hype is building up around it. Why are we so convinced that the metaverse is going to be the next big thing? I think movies, they are, they're the problem, right? That we've been hearing about augmented reality since, since 1977 with the first Star Wars film. No one batted an eyelid that Chewbacca and C-3PO, a, a woolen bear from another planet and an android robot were playing chess with these pieces that moved around. Didn't bat an eyelid to that. Didn't bat an eyelid when Tony Stark's moving stuff around in, in, in Iron Man or Minority Report or in Avatar. We'd never bat an eyelid because we just assume we see it so much that we just, oh, yeah, that's obvious. That's clearly what's going to happen. That is, that is how I'm going to play chess in, the next, in two years' time, right? We assume that's what's going to happen. The same with virtual reality. We've been seeing virtual reality on our screens for such a long time that it just seems to make sense that this is going to happen. Whether it was, again, in the early 80s with Tron, where they're sucked inside the mainframe, or Lawnmower Man in 1992, or you've got Johnny Mnemonic or even Free Guy recently. This idea of these virtual worlds has been seen so many times, we just assume it's going to be real. It's got to happen. Why on earth won't? If these guys can can think it up, then man's ingenuity means it will become real. Artificial intelligence. Again, you know, Skynet, Terminator. That didn't end too well. Actually, none of these ended particularly well. You know, you've got Skynet and Terminator and artificial intelligence there. You've got war games from 1984. It started World War Three nearly with artificial intelligence. Why on earth would we want to do that? The daddy of them all was, uh, was Hal in 2001. That didn't end well either. And then, you know, Joaquin Phoenix fell in love with the voice of Scarlett Johansson in her. Artificial intelligence has been something that we've seen there that we're now assuming it's bound to happen. We've seen it so often. Supercomputers and network computers. Superman 3, way back in 1984. You know, we've been talking about these computers since before the internet existed. We were talking about supercomputers and network computers and, and things just happening that, that we didn't need to interact with in any way, shape, or form for such a long time that it's just bound to happen. Why wouldn't it happen? Daniel Kahneman, the noted Nobel Prize winning economist, kind of sums it up, right? That the more we see something, the more we hear from something, the more important we make it. And the more we've seen and heard about augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and what they're going to achieve, the more we see it in the newspapers, the more we hear about it here on stages like this, the more we believe it's going to be true. Why wouldn't we? So let's think about that Wall Street Journal article. I mean, this is McKinsey, right? McKinsey are a very well-renowned management consultancy staffed with some really, really clever people. And the Wall Street Journal, right? they don't print lies. I can't claim benefit for this. This was my friend James Watley. James Watley is the chief strategist at an agency in, in the UK called Diva. It's a gaming agency. right? And he saw this article and went, five trillion in 2030. That's like eight years from now. That's, that's a lot of money to be spending on a thing that technically doesn't exist. I'm going to do a deep dive into this. So he did. Well, he read the article. 
which is a, was the best thing to do, rather than just look at the headlines. And he found this line in it. This line in it that said that for the purpose of this study, McKinsey said any online experience, they will count any online experience as the metaverse. Didn't have to be virtual reality at all. Didn't have to be interoperable. Actually, what they were talking about was online spending was going to reach $5 trillion by 2030. Nothing to do with the metaverse at all. It's just people are going to spend a lot of money. Whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. that kind of makes sense. Looked a bit further as well. It's like, but hold on, 79% of those who responded to the survey said they'd bought something in the metaverse. But it doesn't exist. So he did some more diving into this. And he found the report that McKinsey did. It's a 77-page PDF document that you can find on their website. And I don't know what page it was on, but he found this. This is the key data that they were using. That 79% of consumers had bought an in-game purchase or had used, purchased something in the metaverse to improve their in-game experience. So actually, online spending is going to equal £5 trillion because 79% of respondents had bought something in a game. In a game. That could be Candy Crush, for Christ's sake. That could be anything. In fact, and that's not that big a number when you think about it, because Fortnite, a game, billion dollars of profit last year. Uh, Roblox made $2 billion of profit. Minecraft was up to $1 billion. Call of Duty, since inception, has grown into a $27 billion industry all on its own. So when you start thinking about uh, Legends of Zelda and Final Front Fantasy and, all, and Grand Theft Auto and all of the other games, you can imagine, hold on, gaming might be worth five trillion pounds, but gaming's been around for an awful long time. Why, why are we talking about it as if it's the next big thing and the metaverse? Because, let me just reiterate this, the metaverse is not a thing. If, uh, all right, let me, I, I, ought to, I, ought to, uh, I ought to expand on why I don't think it's a thing. So we're going to go back to this, because Matthew Ball is the daddy of the metaverse. Again, he's released this book, and if you look it up on Amazon, you've got every big Silicon Valley company in Silicon Valley. Every CEO has, has said, what an amazing book this is, right? And it really details the, the, uh, the metaverse. These are the key big words, right? These are the key big words that he's using, that it's interoperable, that it's real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds, that it happens synchronously and persistent, and it's an unlimited number of users. So there's the four key tenets of what the metaverse is apparently all about. It is persistent. That means it's always on. This metaverse is that we can drop in and out of it, we can go, and go in there, hang out there. If there's no one there, we can leave again. Someone else might come in, but it's always churning away in the background. It's persistent. It is always on. This metaverse that we're all going to live in is always on. It's interoperable. So, you know, you can build your personality, build your avatar, and you can move it around the various places of this metaverse. You can take it from one game into another, into a shopping experience. You can live your life however you like, on this virtual world, in this metaverse, and it's interoperable across all platforms. That it's not owned by anyone, right? It is a, like just as the world's not owned by anyone, we're moving into a new space that's, that's completely decentralized. That it's free, and it's transparent, and it's trustworthy, because it's decentralized. And it's immersive. This is, this is an immersive world, because it's not the real world, right? This is the metaverse. And we've got to get to the metaverse, and we've got to immerse ourselves in the metaverse. So, you know, it involves tools and devices. So these four key terms, this is how we're going to live. This is what the metaverse is going to be about, right? Or is it? Persistence. So, uh, Lorenzo talked about the Travis Scott gig. I had, I had to sit through it. My son wanted, was desperate to watch it, so we sat through it. And, and I find it interesting that they say 27 billion people. And the way they, they talk about it, it was this big, mass experience. The fact of the matter was, there was only ever 49 people in a room at any one time watching that concert. We didn't all watch it together. We watched it in groups of 49 people. Because actually, the servers required to enable 
27 million people to all be in one place at one time in one virtual world are just, they haven't been invented. Those servers don't yet exist. You can only ever play Fortnite with 99 to 100 people, 99 or 100 people at any one time, because that's how much it, it takes in a huge amount of energy. To create a virtual world that is persistently on would require the energy, the servers would require the energy of a small nation just to power it, the national grid of a small country. And considering we've got an energy crisis going on and actually we're running out of energy, it just seems kind of ludicrous to imagine that we're going to create a persistent world that is always on, that takes the energy that we just don't have. Interoperability. So, interoperability. This is this idea that I'm going to buy something, I'm going to move it about places. Right, so Fortnite is uh, owned by Epic Games. They are a privately owned company, but actually 40% of them is owned by Tencent, which is the largest gaming company in the world. They made £4 billion worth of profit, and they did that because they do licensing deals. They do that because you buy stuff and it keeps you on their platform. It would be mental for them to say, yeah, 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 let's take that, go over there. Oh, and you know what? You can bring whatever you like into our world. We're not going to charge you for it. We're just going to let you freely move around. We're going to give away our profit margin so that you can move freely around. Minecraft is owned by Microsoft. Roblox is a publicly trading company. But Roblox is not allowed. They have to be in this for, to create shareholder value. And by allowing interoperability within Roblox would, would chip away at that uh, shareholder value. So it's just simply never going to happen. But Minecraft, just this week, announced their deal with Burberry. Can you imagine then that Burberry have just spent all this money to create a deal with Minecraft and Microsoft for then someone to just go, yeah, we're going to go and use it in, in Fortnite. And we don't know what it's going to look like in Fortnite. We don't know how it's going to work in Fortnite. And actually, the, they're built on different platforms. You know, One's on Unreal Engine, one's on something. It just won't work. And, it, and it's in the interest of those parent companies to not make it work. So we can talk about this as a potential all we like, but it's kind of never going to happen. Decentralization, the beauty of NFTs and blockchain. You know that these three companies, Board Ape Yacht Club, Cyberpunks, and the MeBits, are all owned by one company, Yuga Labs. They're not decentralized at all. They're owned by one company. And in fact, the, the platform that you buy and sell, the main platform that we buy and sell NFTs on OpenSea, is owned by two people. That's not decentralized. That's owned. These are very clearly owned by someone somewhere. And they set the terms of reference of what you can and can't do with those things. Snoop Dogg selling NFTs to his latest album. You own no licensing rights. You cannot use that for anything. He still owns all the IP in it. All you can say is, I've got a piece of paper. Not even a piece of paper. I've got a piece of code somewhere hidden in the depths of my computer that says I own that. And that's it. You own no rights to it. You own no IP to it. You can do nothing with it. These are not decentralized at all. We're sold a myth that it's being decentralized because it's in someone's interest somewhere to make it so. And this idea of being immersive. Really? Do we really want to strap these things to our heads? I spend far too much, since the pandemic, and now that I live in the world of Zoom rooms and video calls, I spend my entire life staring into a screen. I don't really want that screen right here in front of my eyes. I spend an awful lot of time trying to convince my kids not to spend six hours aimlessly scrolling through TikTok. I don't really want that up here. It's bad. I, at least they can look up and look at me. I don't want to have to a virtual world to tell my kids to stop looking at TikTok when I've sat right next to them. <laughs> so there's this idea. <laughs> so the thing that makes it immersive just isn't going to work, right? So then I think, well, where is all of this hype coming from? Why, is it, why are we going down this route? What is it that the metaverse is going to do that, that actually justifies this level of hype? Considering the metaverse is not a thing, right? Throughout history, when we've invented stuff or discovered stuff, it's had a use. 
there has been a very important use case for all innovation throughout history. Whether it's fire, the discovery of fire meant that man could keep warm, they had light, and they could cook food and get more energy. It sort of lifted us up as a species from just being another primate. We became the, the ultimate primate. And it, and it set us on our trajectory. So, so fire had a real good use. The wheel, when, when we discovered or created or invented the wheel, it meant that transportation opened up to us. The Egyptians could move huge pieces of stone and create the pyramids. We could start traveling around places. We suddenly were able, with that and the lever, we could move things around places. Then we got the printing press, and suddenly we could store information without just drawing it on walls, and we could recreate this information. Suddenly we could start creating a library of, of content of all of our achievements and start sharing it with people. Then when you get the wheel and the fire together and you create engines and that fuels the industrial revolution and actually then mass production starts and automation starts and we start doing some incredible things because we've found a use for this stuff. Then you get radio and now we've got mass communication. Now we can speak to people all around the world. TV added, added pictures to that. And we had, here we've got an invention, with an innovative solution to an actual problem of how do we convey ideas and images around the world to, to people who aren't right next to us. And then the internet comes along. When we've got the internet, although it didn't have a... It, well, it did. When it was first invented, discovered, it was so that universities could share information with, between one another. And as it's evolved, it's become we've got access to the world's information. Everything we ever knew is right there in our pocket at the internet. And now we've got the metaverse. And what does the metaverse do? I mean, it's not a thing, right? But the that around this, it, it serves one purpose and one purpose only. It makes money. It makes money for an awful lot of big corporations. It makes money for people selling us hardware. It makes money for people selling us games. It makes money for people trying to transform our lives and tell them that actually we don't want to sit in a hall like this. We want to sit in a virtual representation of this hall where we can't actually touch and feel one another, but we can interact in, in new, interesting ways. How's that working out there, Mr. Zuckerberg? So just this, right, this, in September of 2021, Meta was valued at $1 trillion. This week, it was valued at $268 billion. It's lost $700 billion in market cap in less than a year. He has spent, or the company have spent $20 billion on that. Imagine what we could have done, what society could have done with $20 billion rather than, well, $700 billion is the combined GDP of Central America. He's lost the combined GDP of Central America on a folly that does not exist, that isn't adding anything to society, that is just a gamble to make more money for people. Because the metaverse is not a thing. I just can't stress that enough. <laughs> it is a collection of tools that already exist. And don't get me wrong, I think some of these tools are fantastic. In fact, I've got three great examples for you. These are three people who I know personally that are doing wonderful things. This is a com There's a company I know, I know the two founders of, and they're called Tailwind Studios. They build Roblox games. They're not in the metaverse, they're building Roblox games. They're a games company that are building games. They're building beautiful games. They've got investment of $6 million, $6 million to start doing this stuff. They're a wonderful startup, creating super engaging, entertaining, uh, inf informative games in Roblox for kids. Fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant company. Or you've got Kudos. Again, I know the founder of this. I used to work with him. This is a blockchain company, and I'm a massive cynic about blockchain as well. <laughs> but these guys, what they've created this system where they can use the, the spare CPU power in computers all over the world. They're, they're mining for Bitcoin, a little bit unnecessary. But still, they've, they've created this way of, of, of accessing the spare CPU cap power so that actually they can turn all of those things into uh, the massive, giant, interconnected servers that we might need. It's a, it's a fantastic, really smart 
use of a technology, a blockchain technology, but it's not the metaverse. Or the, this is, these guys are the ones I work with. This is there's a, the Orthopedic Research Institute at Bournemouth University. They are pioneering hip replacements in space using virtual reality and robots. Now, I know I said they ought to have a use, and pioneering hip replacements in space doesn't sound like the most useful thing in the world, but given that all the billionaires seem to be trying to get to Mars at the moment, and we know we can get to Mars because we've landed on Mars, and we know that once we're on Mars, we can sustain life and we can create water. What we've discovered is Mars is quite rocky. And if you fall over on Mars and perhaps break your hip, the ambulance is going to take nine months to get there. And then it's going to take nine months to come back. So by using virtual reality technology, surgeons are able to perform that operation whilst you're somewhere else. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be in space, right? It could be somewhere on planet Earth. But the fact is they're using virtual reality, virtual reality technology and robots to do something really useful, really life-changing for an awful lot of people. But it's not the metaverse. Because the metaverse is not a thing. <laughs> I don't think... Look, we can be hopeful, we can be optimistic. And it might be that the metaverse is not a thing yet. Okay? But considering those four tenets of what the metaverse is and how unlikely I think it is that they will ever be useful, I'm a little bit doubtful. I don't think the metaverse is ever going to be anything huge. I think we'd probably be far better off spending our time focusing on socioeconomic division that happens all around the world, looking at hunger, looking at uh, the, and, and war and all kinds of things that the metaverse will never solve. But that money that we're investing in it just might. Of course, games are fine, virtual reality is fine and all those things. Thank you.